three theories of banking, competing against each other for over the past century and a half. The credit creation theory, the fractional reserve theory, and the financial intermediation theory. In 2014, Werner produced the first ever empirical study in the 5,000 year history of banking, and it proved that the credit creation theory is correct. So let's look deeper into this theory and how banks create credit, or money, out of thin air. According to the credit creation theory, banks individually create credit out of nothing whenever they issue a loan. When a loan is granted by a bank, they purchase a loan contract. Legally, this is considered a promissory note issued by the borrower of the bank. This is reflected by an increase in the bank's assets by the amount of the loan. The borrower receives the money when the bank credits the borrower's account. And through this process of credit creation, 97% of the money supply is actually created out of nothing. It is purely fictitious. As Werner said in 2005, bank credit creation does not channel existing money to new users. It newly creates money that did not exist beforehand and channels it to some use. So how do banks actually create this money out of thin air and what makes them special to other firms? Why are non-banks unable to do this? To explain, let's compare the accounting of a loan when extended by a non-financial corporation, such as a manufacturer to a supplier, a non-bank financial institution, such as a stockbroker extending a margin loan to a client, and a bank lending money to a small business. In the UK, any firm or individual can actually grant a loan. It is not a regulated activity. So how are banks different to these non-bank financial institutions and non-financial corporations such as a manufacturer? As you'll know, all firms have a balance sheet. This consists of assets, liabilities and shareholders' equity at a specific point in time. Let's start with the manufacturer giving a loan of 10 million to its supplier. When the manufacturer grants the loan, it is purchasing a loan contract, or more specifically, a promissory note as we discussed earlier. This appears in the manufacturer's balance sheet as an increase in assets. This increase in assets is actually the manufacturer's claim on the debtor. Well, what is this claim? This is the supplier's promise to repay the loan to the manufacturer. At the exact same time, the manufacturer has an increase on the liability side as an accounts payable. The supplier is due to be paid as per the agreement. When the manufacturer disperses the loan, it is drawing down its cash reserves and it now no longer needs to pay the supplier, so accounts payable disappears. As a result, one gross asset increase is matched by an equally sized gross asset decrease, leaving net total assets unchanged. What's left on the balance sheet is simply the loan contract. The cash reserves have been drawn down and the accounts payable has disappeared. Next, let's look at the stockbroker engaging in margin lending. So this is a non-bank financial institution. The stockbroker again purchases a promissory note, a claim on the client who is borrowing the funds, the promise by the client to repay the funds at a future date. This increases the total assets. At the same time, there is an increase in accounts payable as a client is due to be paid. The disbursement of a loan, for example by transferring cash to the client, lowers the cash on the asset side while simultaneously reducing accounts payable as a firm discharges its obligation to pay the borrower. In the end, both total assets and liabilities remain unchanged. The only visible change is the category of assets on the balance sheet. We now have a loan contract there. As you can see, for both the non-bank financial corporation and the non-financial corporation such as the manufacturer, the balance sheet total is not affected by the granting and disbursement of a loan. However, this is not the same in the case of a bank, which has a banking license. To understand the difference, it is important to disaggregate the lending process into two steps. First, step one, the balance sheet upon purchasing the promissory note and having an accounts payable. And step two, when the loan funds are paid out and accounts payable disappears. In step one, the situation looks pretty much the same. The bank purchases a promissory note from a borrower and the asset side of a bank's balance sheet increases by 10 million pounds. On the liability side, accounts payable also increases by 10 million pounds as the bank owes the borrower funds. 
the accounting is identical for all three types of lenders. This means whatever makes banks special must appear in step two. Banks behave very differently when the bank must provide the funds to the borrower. Instead of needing to make funds available to the borrower by drawing down cash as needed in the other two cases, a bank doesn't have to give up anything to pay out the loan. There is no requirement to draw down on cash reserves. So how is it then that the borrower believes that the bank's obligation to pay them has been met? Well this is done through the very powerful accounting change that takes place on the liability side during step 2. The bank does reduce its accounts payable by 10 million, but at the exact same time it increases deposits on the liability side. It reclassifies accounts payable as deposits. Well, why is this and what actually is a deposit? Although it might surprise you, you do not own the funds in your bank account. You have not deposited your funds and the bank is certainly not holding them on your behalf. In fact, a deposit is a loan to the bank, a liability and an obligation for the bank to pay back the lender. It is a record of debt to the public. Therefore, it has reclassified accounts payable to another category of liability, namely a deposit. The bank no longer needs to pay an account. The bank just simply owes you the money. No transfer of funds has actually taken place from one person's account to a borrower's account. Although the small business has the impression that the bank has transferred money from its capital, reserves or someone else's account to the small business account, it has not. Neither the bank nor the small business has deposited any money. In step 1, the bank had a liability to pay an account. The law states the most common way to be discharged from liability is through payment. But no payment has taken place in step 2. So the bank's balance sheet remains stuck in step 1 and the balance sheet has lengthened. The bank's liability has simply been renamed as bank deposit. Bank deposits are defined by central banks as being part of the official money supply. So if bank deposits are increasing, the money supply is increasing. Therefore, whenever a bank grants a loan, they invent fictitious customer deposits, which all users of our monetary system consider to be money, indistinguishable from real deposits. Thus, banks do not just grant credit, they create it. They create money out of thin air. Banks are thought of as deposit-taking institutions that then lend out. Well, as you now know, banks do not take deposits and banks do not lend money. Now let's consider what happens when the customer of the bank, the small business, wants to pay the supply using the newly created money. Now in a one bank system, or where the bank is sufficiently large enough that both the small business and their supplier's account are both held at the same bank, the deposit amount doesn't change. Although the amount doesn't change, who it's owed to does. The bank no longer owes the money to the small business, but it owes it instead to the small business supplier. If, however, the supplier holds an account at another bank, the small business bank deposits are going to fall, and with it an asset class, for example cash. At the same time, the deposits at the supplier's bank will increase, and again an asset class will increase with it. Overall, credit has still been created. So although we're aware of the accounting that allows banks to create credit, what is it that actually allows the accounting to take place? In the UK, the so-called client money rules require all firms that hold client money to segregate such money in accounts that keep them separate from the assets or liabilities of the firm itself. A firm, on receiving any client money, must promptly place this money into one or more accounts open with any of the following. A central bank, a CRD credit institution, a bank authorised in a third country, or a qualifying money market fund. Neither the manufacturer or the stockbroker used in our earlier examples have a banking authorization, meaning client deposits must be held in segregated accounts with banks or money market funds. This means the client assets always remain off balance sheet. The depositor always remains the legal owner of those funds. However, things are different if one has a banking license. The client money chapter does not apply to a depository when acting as such. So therefore, what actually enables banks to create money is their exemption from the client money rules. As Werner said in 2014, banks do not have to segregate client accounts and thus are able to engage in an exercise of relabeling and mixing different liabilities, 